All right, welcome to the Quick Media Come Follow Me series. We are covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 106 through 108. Almost everything we're going to cover here is going to be in 107. Really like section 107. If you were to put three sections together on the priesthood, um, they would be, I think, sections 20, 84, and 107, especially 84 and 7. They really give us a strong foundation for the idea, the concept of the higher and the lower laws as they divide up the higher and the lower priesthoods, the Melchizedek and the Aaronic priesthoods. Before we get into section 107, I wanted to cover something quickly here in section 106. This is about Warren Cowdery. This is Oliver Cowdery's older brother, Joseph Smith travels back east. Uh, uh, Warren Cowdery is in uh, Freedom, New York, and he's asked to uh, build the church out there and, and, and to be more of a leader there. He ends up falling away from the church after he moves to Kirtland, and after a couple years in Kirtland, he ends up falling away from the church. But here in verse 7 is, again, another example of our idea of that ticket that brings you into, as I describe it, the fluid hierarchy. It is the submission and then the rising up into that fluid hierarchy as you, as you move up. Here's what we get in verse 7. Therefore, blessed is my servant Warren, for I will have mercy on him. And notwithstanding the vanity of his heart, I will lift him up inasmuch as he will humble himself before me. So again, this is the whole idea of meekness, which is really submission to covenant uh, and it's the whole idea of the tree of life, which represents the doctrine of Christ or the condescension of God, the condescension being him lowering himself down below all the rest of us. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. When we partake of the fruit of the tree of life, we go there and we lower ourselves. We humble ourselves below God. We, we do that in front of others. We symbolically lower ourselves below others and bear their burdens. And on the opposite side of that is we raise ourselves up instead. And that's the pride of the great and spacious building. So by humbling oneself, which is oftentimes represented in baptism, right, as we submit and, and lower ourselves into the water, into the watery grave, we are then lifted up at that point, just like the brazen serpent is lifted up. So just another example of, of the uh, entry into the fluid hierarchy. Now here in section seven, we have the meat of what we're going to cover here today. This really is a great section on the organization of the priesthood, on the organization of the church. Even this being almost 200 years old, this is pretty much still the foundational uh, priesthood organization that we find in the church today. Now let's go directly to verse 1. There are in the church two priesthoods, namely the Melchizedek and Aaronic, those are the two, including the Levitical priesthood. What is the difference there? That sounds like three different priesthoods. Well, the Levitical priesthood is a part of the Aaronic priesthood in a sense. What you have here, the Aaronic priesthood is built around the office of priest. And the priests were the sons of Aaron and their sons and their sons. And you had to have that lineage to be a priest. The others that were in the priesthood, in the Levitical priesthood, remember Aaron is part of the tribe of Levi, so is Moses, by the way, right? They're brothers. Then you find uh, other offices that we represent today, such as the teachers and the deacons that were the Levites of the Old Testament under the same lower priesthood. So just as today with the sacrifice that we have each week, so to speak, of the sacrament on the altar or the sacrament table, you have those that would prepare the sacrifice. Those are the Levites or today the, the teachers, those that would distribute the sacrifice. So when a sacrificial animal was brought and a burnt offering was made, it basically becomes like a barbecue in a sense. And that is given out first to the priest, right? The presiding priesthood holder receives first the distribution of that meat, just like we do with 
the bishop or the stake president or whoever is there presiding in a sacrament meeting, and then is distributed to the family and those that are there offering this sacrifice. Uh, and, and that's the deacons, right? And those are also the Levites that would do that. In the Old Testament, who would collect the tithes and the offerings? It was the Levites, like we have the deacons do today. So the Aaronic and Levitical are, are, are kind of brought together, but there is a separation there. Aaronic specifically being that of the uh, office of priest. Okay, now verse 2. Why the first is called the Melchizedek priesthood is because Melchizedek was such a great high priest. Now, so it's named after a person, but Melchizedek is also a title. Remember that Melchizedek or Tzedek, Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Something very similar to this, another title, for example, that Christ has and others can have, is that he is the Prince of Peace, something very similar. Melchizedek was a high priest, but he was also the king of Salem, or Shalom, which is rooted in the same word that means peace. So he's the king of righteousness. He's also the prince of peace, literally, over Salem or Jerusalem, right? And so this is the same thing for Christ. He is the new Melchizedek. It is a title. And in verse 3, Before his day, it was called the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. Notice that the Melchizedek priesthood, as we've gone over previously, has to do with those things. It administers the spiritual things, that is, the things of the higher law. The higher law, you can think of as the things that come from on high. They are the things that are brought through the veil or that condescend down to man through the veil. I've talked to you before about the title of the Son of God. The Son of God means the one who condescends. So the condescension of Christ, the condescension of God, is when God lowers himself to be born of Mary. We oftentimes think of the Son of God and we think, oh, we're talking about the Father. That's not what Son of God means. The Son of God means the one who condescends, the one who is born of Mary, who condescends in in baptism and lowers himself into the waters, and who condescends in Gethsemane, lowering himself below alls and bearing upon his shoulders the burdens of all of mankind. That makes all the sense in the world, because things such as grace and mercy that are anchored in that atoning sacrifice are what come from God. They're the gifts of God. The Holy Ghost would also be something coming down through the veil, the gifts of the Spirit. These are all spiritual things, things that are administered by the Melchizedek priesthood. Now, in verse 13, we have the second priesthood. It's called the priesthood of Aaron because it was conferred upon Aaron and his seed. Aaron is from the tribe of Levi. So the other sons that came from the tribe of Lehi that were not descendants of Aaron, which would be the the majority, right? were Levites. So they had the Levitical priesthood, but they were not priests. Why it is called the lesser priesthood, this is verse 14, is because it is an appendage to the greater or the Melchizedek priesthood and has power in administering outward ordinances. So the outward ordinances would be the opposite of what we would think of as inward ordinances. What are inward ordinances? Inward ordinances would be what is in our inside, inside of us, our hearts, our minds, our spirit. They are spiritual things. Melchizedek priesthood administers over spiritual things. Outward ordinances would be things that are out in our physical world. They are temporal. They are carnal. They're the things that we do to strive to reach up to God as opposed to the higher law, which reaches down to us. We get additional confirmation of this in verse 18. The power and authority of the higher or Melchizedek priesthood is to hold the keys of all the spiritual blessings of the church. It's more a representation of God, and the Aaronic priest is more the representation of man. You can also look at it as, in my opinion, the Aaronic priesthood is more the priesthood of the individual and the Melchizedek priesthood goes outside of the individual, especially to family and to Zion or community. Now, here in verse 22 is where we start getting this 
idea of checks and balances. We don't usually think of the priesthood, the general priesthood of the church in this in these terms. But this is true. This is how this works. It says here in verse 22, of the Melchizedek priesthood, three presiding high priests chosen by the body, appointed and ordained to that office, and upheld by the confidence, faith, and prayer of the church, form a quorum of the presidency of the church. So the first presidency of the church is in and of itself a three-member quorum. However, going down to verse 23, the 12 traveling counselors are called to be the 12 apostles or special witnesses of the name of Christ in all the world. 24, and they form a quorum. So now we get the quorum of the 12 apostles. But here's what it says. They are equal in authority and power to the three presidents previously mentioned. We usually don't think of it in those terms, but they are. They have the same power as the quorum of the first presidency. Now, you might say, well, yeah, they're all prof- uh, prophets, seers, and revelators. No, not individually. The quorums themselves have the same exact power. I'm going to get to this uh, and, and, and draw some support on this here in just a minute. In 25, the 70 are also called to preach the gospel and to be special witnesses unto the Gentiles in all the world. You see, oftentimes with the 70, the coupling of the Gentiles, of getting out to the Gentiles, out to the world. The reason is, is that the 70 is a number that represents the whole world. And so you see this a lot in the Book of Mormon, where they had the Melchizedek priesthood, where they talk a lot more, not just about the tribes of Israel and the Jews, but they talk about the isles of the sea and the gospel going out to the isles of the sea everywhere. Remember that when the 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 fullness of the gospel was given by Jesus to his apostles, shortly thereafter, after the death of, of, of Jesus Christ, you have Peter having his vision, where now we're going to go out to beyond the Jews. We're going to go out to the Gentiles. And that's kind of the, the focus of the 70. They also are mentioned along with the Jews and going to the Jews after the Gentiles, but the 70 are really focused in on the Gentiles. The reason is that the number 70 used to represent the world. It, it was probably anchored in something like the 70 na- known nations of the world. And so there would be like a representative for each one of the nations of the world. That The number 70 represented a whole, a complete, like seven means perfect or complete. But that's that was the idea behind that. But here in verse 26, just like the Quorum of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, it says the 70 form a quorum equal in authority to that of the 12 special witnesses or apostles just mentioned, just named. So now we have three different quorums that have the exact same power, right? They have our authority. And this is very similar to the U.S. Constitution, where you have the three branches of government. You've got the executive branch, you've got the judicial branch, and you've got the legislative branch. And they have checks and balances on each other. We don't think in those terms in the church, but that's the way the Constitution, if you will, of of the church is written. Those three quorums each have equal authority. Here's the catch. Verse 27, and every decision made by either of these quorums, these three quorums, must be by the unanimous voice of the same. That is, every member in each quorum must be agreed to its decisions in order to make their decisions of the same power or validity one with the other, right? That is the other quorums. And so you have the authority of the of the, pres- the first presidency just needs consensus by three. You have the quorum of the 12 apostles that needs consensus of 12. And then you have the quorum of the 70, which if I'm not mistaken, I think that there are nearly 100 members in that, what we call the general authorities the, the general uh, uh, authority uh, quorum of the, tw- of, of the 70. 
those that are actually general authorities. Or you would need a consensus of nearly 100, I believe, currently, that would need to be equal in power to the other two quorums. But there is a checks and balances. And in fact, I had looked for this for a while. I finally found it today. A reference to this from a, 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 a person of authority that would say something about what I was thinking when I read this, which is, this has to do with the quote. I think it's Wilford Woodruff that says that the prophet will never lead us astray. I think we take that way out of context sometimes. We think that they can never say anything that's wrong or, you know, they, 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 examples are brought up about policy changes and all of these things. And usually it's the critics of the church that want to put it over into almost a fundamentalist box of understanding of Scripture and of Revelation. I don't think that that's what it means. Here is a quote from James E. Faust. He says, How can we be so sure that, as promised, the prophets, seers, and revelators will never lead this people astray? This is different from what we usually think. One answer is contained in the grand principle found in the 107th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, right where we're at. It says, And every decision made by either of these quorums must be by the unanimous voice of the same. So this is different from what we might think about every word coming out of the prophet's mouth. He says, This requirement of unanimity provides a check on bias and personal idiosyncrasies. It ensures that God rules through the Spirit, not man through majority or compromise. This is from General Conference, October 1989. I think that the talk is called Continuous Revelation. So I had looked for that, and sure enough, there it is. And I think that that's another way to look at how the prophet can't can't pull us away because there's a check on him. And it's not just you say, well, wait a minute, Greg, he's the prophet. He's inspired in everything that he says. And, you know, he's a man too. And, and, and I think that you look at how we're told here in the Doctrine and Covenants that the, the uh, um, Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, was inspired of God to provide liberty and leadership and organization for, for mankind, ho- hopefully for the whole world, as, as we're told in the Doctrine and Covenants. This is the same exact inspiration that gives us the organization of the church. There is a check and balance. Now, has that ever happened in the past, I don't doubt that that's happened by the Quorum of the Twelve, at least. I don't know about the Quorum of the Seventy. That seems like uh, that would really take something to be unanimous. But that check and balance is there. And, of course, the general authorities know this. So just a little something that we usually don't think about when we talk about the prophet will never lead us astray. Here we have Elder James E. Faust telling us a reference to, to that idea here right in section 107. Now, this is also something that I think is important, and I, I've heard this secondhand, that this is a, a scripture that is oftentimes referenced in making decisions within each of these quorums. This is verse 30. It says, The decisions of these quorums, or either of them, are to be made in all righteousness, in holiness and lowliness of heart, meekness, which would be, I think, covenant-keeping to me, and long-suffering, and in faith and virtue and knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. And so these are the virtues that are supposed to be governing the decisions of each one of these quorums and probably should be the virtues and attributes that we should be looking for with all of the decisions of any quorum in the priesthood or auxiliary in the church. And then coming down all the way to verse 40. The order of this priesthood, this is the the Melchizedek priesthood, was confirmed to be handed down from father to son and rightly belongs to the literal descendants of the chosen seed to whom the promises were made. There's always a chosen seed. The chosen seed is the family that brings the gospel to the world. You have to start somewhere. You don't just pass out the knowledge of the gospel everywhere and, 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 you know, like throwing a bunch of wet spaghetti up on a refrigerator door. You have to start somewhere, start with a core, start with a prophet, start with a very righteous couple, and then build out from there. 
And that's what we see over and over again throughout the dispensations of human history. So this is what happens with Adam. And so we get this lineage of the priesthood coming down father to son, father to son, father to son. And then we're told in 53, three years previous to the death of Adam, he called Seth, his son, and Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, and Methuselah, who were all high priests. These are all son to son to son to son, right? Now, we can look at this more like these are like state presidents or more. I mean, according to the Bible, these were men that lived hundreds of years. And so the, the, the progeny is, is pretty expansive here. And, and so they're probably over large units of, and tribes of the church at this point. It says they were all high priests with the residue of his posterity were righteous into the valley of Adam on die Amon. Remember that is Adam walks with God. Amon is, I believe, is Hebrew, but you can also look at uh, other Semitic names. You can look at Egyptian with the god Amun, right? And, and, and really, that's probably the same source of where we get the word, the name Ammon in the Book of Mormon. So Adam walks with God, and there bestowed upon them his last blessing. We see this over and over again in the Scriptures, too. We see this in the, uh, the Book of Mormon where once they are in the promised land, Lehi is going to be passing soon. So he gathers all of his posterity together and he gives them blessings and then prophesies about the future of his descendants. Here we get the same thing. In 54, we're told, and the Lord appeared unto them and they rose up and blessed Adam and called him Michael, the prince, the archangel. These are titles to me. The prince would be similar to Melchizedek, right, or to Christ, which would be, in this instance, a title that would mean the prince of peace. This is about exaltation. These are titles that that are are Melchizedek priesthood types of titles, just like the Melchizedek priesthood is. Melchizedek was a great high priest, but but Melchizedek is also a title right? Meaning king of righteousness. And Christ is called in the book of Hebrews, the new Melchizedek, the new king of righteousness. It's not just that he's the new Melchizedek who is the king of Salem, but he is the new righteous king. He is a righteous king. He represents the Melchizedek priesthood, whereas John the Baptist represented the Aaronic priesthood. And we get right to the oath and covenant of the priesthood here again in 56 that would go right along with a Melchizedek priesthood. And Adam stood in the midst of the congregation, and notwithstanding he was bowed down with age, being full of the Holy Ghost, predicted whatsoever should befall his posterity unto the latest generation. Same thing with Lehi. There's the same exact thing that's going on here. Now, I, I know in the summary it says verse 60 on, It was given three and a half years earlier in November of 1831. It was held on to, and then it gets sewn into the last half, pretty much, of of Section 107. But what's interesting here is it says in 59, to the church, this is where it seems to start, because actually, let me back up here just a little bit. I go to 58. It is the It is the duty of the twelve also to ordain and set in order all the other officers of the church, agreeable to the revelation which says, well, which revelation? The revelation that Joseph Smith already had from three and a half years earlier. And we get the title here in verse 60 that says, Verily I say unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember what I've said about that title. That title is about hierarchical structure from the premortal life, from the council in heaven, from the holy of holies. It is what the Deuteronomists in the time of Lehi tried to get rid of. They wanted to flatten everything out. They flatten the hierarchy there. They want to remove the order. They want just Jehovah. There's no El, there's no Elohim, there's no hosts that would be around God. There is just Jehovah. And so the Lord of hosts here, whenever you see that, you should always look for some type of an idea of temple, the Holy of Holies, where you have the representations of angels and hosts, and, and then also look for structures of priesthood and hierarchy. 
And that's what you typically will find with that title there. Now we go on and talk about elders here and the priests and the teachers and the deacons. And something to consider here is that this is almost like a democratization of the priesthood. And Richard Bushman talks about how this was a time period, much like today, where, where fatherhood was being demeaned. It was being reduced. And, and men felt a little more of a lack of purpose and, and a future. And here comes along something spiritual where it's not just held in the hands of a few men. It's not just the pastor of the church with a few others. Rather, this is a democratization of the priesthood. This is what the Lord wanted at Mount Sinai with Moses originally, a nation of priests. But they, they rejected the higher law, the Melchizedek priesthood for everyone, seeing the face of God, which is a representation of the embrace at the veil of the Holy and Holy, holy of Holies. And Moses breaks the tablets, goes back up Sinai, and comes back down with the law of Moses, the lower law. So now here in, the, in, in, a, in a, a period of restoration, the Lord again wants a nation of priests. And so this is what Richard Bushman says in reference to section 107. In restoring priesthood, Joseph restored fatherhood. He makes this association of, of the priesthood directly with fatherhood, which is very interesting. So that's Richard Bushman who's saying that. The historian who is very much uh, focused in on antebellum times, at times of, of church history, of the restoration of the gospel. So here are these men that may have felt a lack of purpose, a, a lack of spiritual responsibility. He equates this with, with changing that with with a sense of fatherhood and you think about it if that's true if that's true would the church have ever made it without that nation of priests would the families have been strong enough would there have been enough strong men that felt a purpose a spiritual purpose as they took on the duties and responsibilities of these offices that were now offered to most probably most men eventually interesting thought I do think that it's interesting what we get here in verse 91. Remember, I think it was just last week or the week before, we were talking about how the Lord would raise someone like unto Moses, being Joseph Smith. Here we get in 91, and again, the duty of the president of the office of the high priesthood, that is the prophet, is to preside over the whole church and to be like unto Moses, Moses who held the Melchizedek priesthood, who was also a king in a sense. Oftentimes you'll see him portrayed with a crown. He is a Melchizedek. He is a king of righteousness. He is a prince of peace. And so here I think it's interesting where we talk about like unto Moses. Yes, it's Moses is the head of a dispensation. We can look at it that way. He led uh, the church on through the Exodus to the promised land. But it's also that he that the Joseph Smith is being given all of the keys uh, and the gifts necessary to restore the gospel in its fullness. And he, in a sense, becomes kind of like a prince of peace. He becomes a Melchizedek. He is like unto Moses. And lastly, I'm just going to cover this in section 108 in verse 5. Behold, this is the promise of the Father unto you if you continue faithful. This is about Lyman uh, Sherman. He's talking about, what is he talking about? Your sins are forgiven you, your vows, uh, be, the first, uh, be with the first of mine elders. He's talking about the promises of the oath and covenant of the priest. He's talking about exaltation here. And so you get the promise which is always coupled with the Father because it's the Father that has everything, not, not the Son. It's the Father that gives the inheritance to all. Christ is a joint heir with us, hopefully, for all that the Father has. And so the promise is coming from the Father. It is the oath of the oath and covenant of the priesthood, which represents exaltation. All that he has with an eternal increase. 
So we see that oftentimes when you see the promise or even think of the promised land, which is a, a temporal representation of exaltation. There's always a trip going toward the promised land, just like the pathway with the iron rod that goes to the tree of life, like Lehi and his family leaving Jerusalem for the new promised land, like Moses going through the Exodus and Joshua finally bringing in the children of Israel to the promised land. These are representations of what the Father promises and inheritance of all that he has. I'll talk to you next time.